Welcome back from the break. You're watching News X. I'm Udhar Pratap Singh. Reena Pushkarna, a prominent restauranter based in Israel, has been awarded the Pravasi Bhartiya Saman. This remembers the highest honor conferred on overseas Indians achieving excellence in various fields. Reena is on the advisory council of the India Israel Asia Center and is a celebrity chef, restauranter, and business entrepreneur. She was involved in Prime Minister Modi's visit to Israel in 2017 where she hosted a meal for P the PM at the home of Israel Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Joining us live now, in fact, is Reena Pushkarna. She, of course, uh, has just been conferred with this very, very prominent award. So firstly, Reena Pushkarna, welcome to the show and uh, congratulations to you for this award. Thank you so much. I'm really honored. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. Yes. How does it feel, you know, to receive this uh, highest honor conferred by the government of India on our overseas Indian diaspora? I can tell you that, uh, firstly, it was a big, big surprise to me because all my life I've been very proud to be called an Indian and uh, to uh, proud of my heritage and always uh, there to welcome people to my cuisine and then to our culture. But to hear that the government has considered me as a, as a candidate for uh, this award was extremely, extremely surprising. And I mean, I was surprised, shocked. I never worked towards this. So it's, it's, it's like a dream come true. I'm sure my parents above in heaven would be very proud of me. Yes. Just tell us about, uh, you know, your uh, uh, India legacy and your Israeli India legacy, of course, now. Well, I'm, uh, I'm a daughter of a Jewish Baghdadi mother and a Sikh army officer and uh, and I came to Israel in 1983 when people didn't really there was no there was no relationship with India there was no uh, diplomatic relationship with India of course the Jews in India the Jews uh, were always welcome to Israel but the diaspora were more um, busy in integrating themselves and proving their Jewishness. And then suddenly this couple comes along, Rina and Vinod Pushkarna, and we say, we are proud of our heritage, recognize us who we are, through our cuisine, of course, first. But, uh, but that's how everything started in 1983 and slowly moved on to a dream come true for me to, to prepare a meal for both prime ministers, my motherland and my adopted fatherland. So I, there's no words to express my gratitude to the Indian government and to the Israeli government for accepting me. Yes. Now, your Indian restaurant in Tel Aviv reportedly has been uh, integral, we believe, to greater and stronger ties between Prime Minister Modi and Benjamin Netanyahu and, of course, also between Israel and India. Uh, just share that anecdote a bit with us more in detail. Well, let me tell you... Uh, uh, well, uh, in, 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 in uh, the Oslo Peace Accords really took place in our restaurant in Tel Aviv. And uh, we did not know about it till uh, they showed the famous handshake between uh, Prime Minister Rabin and uh, Chairman Arafat on the lawns of the White House with, uh, with uh, President Clinton. And uh, sorry, all these messages coming through from all over the world, I can't believe it. Yes. Anyways, so uh, then they suddenly said, we'll take you back to where it all started. And of course, they zoomed in on Tanduri Tel Aviv. And I remembered that meeting uh, between, uh, between uh, Minister Bel Belin and uh, the, uh, the, the Norwegians and the Palestinian ministers. And I never thought that India would play a great part. Oh my God, India would play a part with their curry rice to be a part of this huge, uh, huge peace accord, which I hope will happen one day. Yes. And, uh, and that was, and then we were, uh, Prime uh, uh, Minister Bellin dedicated a whole page to tell them how they said that they would have it in the Indian restaurant, which was neutral ground for everybody. And, uh, and this is how it uh, progressed to Jerusalem and then later on to Oslo. And of course, the peace accord signed on the lawns of the White House in Washington. 
Okay. Now, your restaurant reportedly also played Cupid to PM Netanyahu and his wife back in the day too. Uh, tell us That's a bit right. about that. Yeah. That's right. Uh, well, when uh, when uh, when uh, Prime Minister Modi visited uh, visited uh, Israel, and uh, Mr. and Mrs. Netanyahu hosted him with an Indian dinner at their residence, and they requested me to come and uh, prepare that evening dinner for them. And then he said to Prime Minister Modi ji, he said, "I'll tell you a secret." Me and Sarah, it was our first date in her restaurant in Tandoori, Tel Aviv, 25 years ago. And uh, our marriage is so successful. We have two beautiful sons. He mentioned it on Twitter also. Yes. And he said, I thought, why not create the magic again and have Rina come over and cook for all of us and create that magic with, with Modi ji and with India. So I think I succeeded with that too. <laughs> Amazing. Yes, uh, these are, of course, you know, anecdotes which will, uh, uh, which are really for the history books. But uh, finally, Rina, what message would you like to give to the Indian diaspora in Israel and also to Indians here in India? Well, I was always proud of my heritage. I think I'm the only one who is always dressed in an Indian salwar kameez with my dot. I said that's my strength, my by bindi. Welcome me with this, where, wherever it is. Never, never put yourself down. Always be proud to be Indian. That's what I feel. If you're proud of your legacy, and if you're, uh, sorry, of your heritage, and uh, if you're proud of doing what you want to do, I think Indians have been successful all over the world. But stand up and say that you're Indian, and that's exactly what I did. I said, accept me, us. We are Indian and we are here to succeed and stay. And that's how we were welcomed into the hearts of the Israelis. That's how the relationship matured so much. That's how we welcomed our embassy, our banks, our business people with the mutual technology and every business deal happening. It all started with simple dal chawal, simple chicken tikka. I think uh, I was not, never involved in politics, but I was witness to all the different stations of, of all the relationships that took place. And I'm very proud to, to say that today coming to India, this is a, like a dream come true. I can't believe it still. Pinch me. Yes. Well, our Indian cuisine is certainly a, a soft power and uh, kudos to you for, for taking that soft power to Israel. Uh, and, and I'm sure it certainly has helped in relations between India and Israel over time. And we certainly hope that will continue. For the time being, Rina Pushkarna, thank you very much for joining us today on NewsX. And congratulations on this award once again. Vikas Khanna, he's one of the first Indian chefs to have been awarded a Michelin star in the United States. He has written 35 books and more. Uh, in fact, he's in the midst of writing one. Even as he was speaking with me, he's directed a film. He's cooked for the Obamas. He's hosted MasterChef India. He started a food distribution drive amid the coronavirus-19 pandemic all the way from New York. Uh, a filmmaker, uh, an author, while he's also this fantastic restaurateur and a chef. And, and, and the biggest of all credential for him being that he's such a humanitarian. It's, it's, it's great to have you, Vikas, on the show. Pleasure to be here, Vikas. Uh, you know, I'm going to start off with the, the latest instance that has happened in 2020, the pandemic. It, it has really, really bad. India especially was suffering in the second wave. And uh, the entire initiative that started off uh, in your brain in New York City to feed the maximum number of Indians that the, the underprivileged, the ones who are needing help, and, and that's how you went about going it. If you could uh, share that particular instance, that idea that came about, and how did you uh, mobilize so many people, so many resources, so many institutions to feed those, I think 50 million Indians uh, were fed through your Feed India initiative? Uh, we crossed 54 or 50, a little bit less than 55. But um, it, it started as a promise to my mom and who said something very important to me. She's saying all what you have earned in your life is a subtotal of the entire country. So when we need you, we can't have your back towards us. 
and I was very skeptical because, you know, I was in New York and time zone difference, resources, India was under lap, lockdown. We couldn't hardly reach out people, you know, it was such a difficult time. And, and she said that this is the time when we need you for the first time. And that really, that really, I, I still, I still feel the gravity of that moment of the call with her. Then she said, this is the first time your mother needs you like this. And I said, mom, I fail, I, I succeed. I'm not going to give up. And we continued working. We built up an entire team in New York. And in, subsequently, we had to build up teams in India. Mm -hmm. Because we had to do teams in uh, different cities. And we had to create centers. So everything had to be done overnight. People we could trust, people we could align ourselves. And, you know, the tribe had to be built on that magnitude. Now, of course, challenges are from important, but there were heartbreaking moments when food reached the people. You know, that was when I would break down. It will be seven o'clock in the morning in New York. And I'll start, be, I'll be like a little baby. Like, I'll be like, oh, I kept the promise, you know. So every single day was a roller coaster ride for me. And it took a toll on everything I was doing. But one good thing was that, you know, we have a team who, and who also keeps boost, like, you know, realigning the moral compass and the set. Every other project can wait. Feeding people at this time can't wait. So there were some of the projects which I'm the most proud of that um, were the ones we do, did the gas stations on the highways were turned into food stations. Mm -hmm. You know, it required a different level of logistics to be understood. You know, it was running like almost like 10 Michelin stars at the same time. And that also in different countries. The pressure was too much, but what kept me going was that when people will receive the food and they'll send me, you know, the team will say that chef, it was a successful event. I think I cried the most when we got the food in the trains, which were going from Delhi and they were dispatching all over India. Mm -hmm. That is when I, I think that night I, or that morning in New York, I cried like a baby. I'm like, because I saw the trains and, you know, we were all reading about what's happening in these trains were taking migrant workers back to their towns. And, you know, they were, it was hot, it was crazy. And it was like, there were no proper stations assigned to stop. But all the station people came together when they saw our teams and we hired people on ground, making puris and pickles and kelas and, you know, water or slippers. That day was very, very, very emotional for me when, even they were not much. We we only fed in that single day. We fed sixteen trains, one okay. six. But that day I felt, oh my God! It was because we had worked for so many months. We had the structure to put this uh, operation together just in a few hours, mm -hmm. and that was. Uh because you are an emotion man and if you take a look at your twitter feeds if you take a look at your instagram feeds you know there's a picture of you feeding your grandmother uh there, there are a number of times your mother also appears on your feed and you and you really love her and you love the intrinsic part of india and amritsar that you come from and that's very reflective in your food as well uh talk to us about your entire journey as a little boy who dreamt of opening up a restaurant and uh, was very frugal in its resources and enterprising as well. And then traveling all the way to New York, earning that Michelin star, having restaurants, uh, working for the topmost restaurants across the world. And then uh, now becoming a restaurateur, you're an author. There's a documentary that you've done. Uh, I remember the Golden Temple where you've done Seva and it was all reflective of who you are as an individual. And that's... Uh, commendable and it's also overwhelming to have an Indian uh, sitting over there in New York and making our entire Indian community very, very proud. Oh, thank you. This, this means a lot. I think it's also, it is impossible until it is done. That's the theme of the new documentary, The Bear for Tempers. It seems always impossible until it's done. And, you know, when we started working in different restaurants or countries or, uh, you know, I left India in 2000, like physically. And I, I feel that, you know, there was still so much of prejudice against being an Indian in restaurants when you applied for jobs, because we couldn't figure out what's the difference between a Michelin star chef and a chef. You know, we, we've always thought that it's like an Oscar winning filmmaker and a filmmaker, right? The world has certain awards and recognitions and certain medals. We are watching the Olympics right now. And 
these medals are confirmation of a global stage and the global stage for food industry is just the michelin star and when we will apply for these restaurants for jobs and you know they will not accept us and they'll always say that you know uh, looking at your background I've, i'm a graduate from the toppers in my college have worked through most of the hotel chains in india all my life i've been cooking and they'll say oh we can put you as a helper or a storekeeper or a cleaner or a delivery boy mm -hmm. and that would always be crushing me because you know we did not have and sometimes i will accept the jobs because i said you know i'll still be around their kitchens and see the operations because i was saying i'm not taking this job i'm trying to see observe the sub portal of decades of your hierarchy how you built it especially in french restaurants that was a very tough thing for me very tough thing and you know you go back to square one and you start working again as dishwashers and start observing new things and you felt gratified because you felt that you no more to stop this you know you want to take what they've done to french cuisine or to japanese food or even to american and european cuisines many of them that how they elevated them in a different way to present it in an this global format of michelin stars it was a very tough challenge but it is it was impossible and i think vinith bhatia winning a michelin was also and by the way i was not the first michelin star it it, it was vinith bhatia i was one of the first in america before me it was suvir saran okay and you know we have to respect that people who did it the first and you know i was still building up the space and when vinith won the michelin star in london that is when my whole concept changed i would disagree with people telling me that you are food is not enough to win a michelin star and i will always punch them with vinith's name and said he did it in london i'm going to do this in new york or oh, but new york doesn't have any love for indian food i said it just takes one person to start dreaming and then everybody starts feeling that's normalized and before i let you go vikas uh, you know you're a dreamer uh, you're an achiever you have uh, so much energy so much motivation uh, and and the concentration levels are just there so you just go on from one project to another and congratulations to you all the very best to you as well uh, what is the one message that you would like to give to indians living over here in india and across the world uh, coming from somebody who has uh, so much pride and prestige uh coming from india and making such a name for himself i think um, it was all a collective effort but i always feel that we have to come together as a community we have to you see my twitter at the moment i see somebody winning something we got to all applause for it but we also got to applause for people who are falling and trying and trying again it they need more of our appreciation and you can see in most of my feeds i keep talking about that and as a com country as people who are living in diaspora so many of us we need to fight for inclusivity you know we pushed way too behind because we don't have sometimes support of each other so i i see that you know when we have a voice we got to use it and we use it as a collective force and that's that's all that's required for all of us to rise together absolutely with that message because thank you so much for joining me on the broadcast uh i wish you all the very best to achieve new goals set your eyes higher and uh, make our country proud nisha uh, my first question that intrigues me and that is going to intrigue the people who are watching us at this point of time is uh, the us india business council women lead initiative what is it all about how did you come up with this idea well um mega in the course of my career and particularly in the course of heading the us india business council i've come across so many extraordinary women um women leaders who have been real pioneers in their field in their industry and they have incredible stories and journeys so you know um the us ibc women lead um um initiative was really born out of the stories of these uh inspiring women and we just felt like we needed to get that out there okay uh what inspired you to come together and utilize this platform that you are heading the us india business council to bring this entire initiative into implementation well we thought that 
through spotlighting the journey of these incredible leaders, that it would also provide mentorship and inspiration to a whole new generation of women who are entering the workforce to be able to um, navigate their own journey, to balance the choices that they have to make, and to really meet the, the aspiration and the potential that each of them have. So we're hoping that by spotlighting these women leaders, that we're also helping to nurture the next generation of women leaders. Okay. You know, I've, I'll come back to it also keeping in mind you are an Indian American and you're an Indian American woman and, and, a, and an extremely successful one at that. But, but I'll keep those questions to the latter part of the interview. But, but what I also want to understand from you is, is the position that you've held in terms of your vast experience in exploring the US-India trade ties, both under the Obama uh, administration and now under the Biden administration. Uh, how do you see that this Indo-US ties are evolving here on in the current scenario? Um, you know, uh, the U.S.-India Business Council was set up long before the U.S. and India were actually doing any kind of business together. Um, it was set up uh, 46 years ago, and it was set up by um, then Secretary of State uh, Henry Kissinger and by his Indian um, counterpart, the Indian um, External Affairs Minister during the Indira Gandhi um, um, era. Mm -hmm. And it was set up with the notion that even if in that time, um, we did not have a uh, commercial or trade relationship, that we knew that we must, that we needed to anchor our partnership in uh, strategic and security, but also in economic um, um, ties between our two countries. And we have seen the U.S.-India trade relationship grow since then. Uh, we are now at $150 billion in two-way trade and investment. It's been growing nicely. But frankly, it is far, far under the potential of what the trade relationship of two of the world's largest economies should be. Mm -hmm. And so USIBC really has been focusing on how do we create the architecture of trade that can really usher in a much more robust partnership okay. that will also then become another pillar in our overall strategic partnership. And, and that's really what USIBC has been focusing on, that we don't have a trade agreement between our two countries. We don't have a bilateral investment treaty between our two countries. Mm -hmm. Businesses have been bullish on India and Indian businesses have been bullish on the United States, but they need, they need the lubricant and the efficiency and efficacy that is ushered in when you have a trade agreement. And so that's what we're pushing for. Uh, and in the meantime, we hope to see a continuing um, um, convergence in our policies and approaches that will just help us increase trade. Okay, uh, that's interesting to note. Why, why do you feel that it has taken so many decades for India and United States to actually come forth with even the proposal of having a US-India agreement, trade agreement, economic agreement? Uh, we've, taken, uh, we've taken a look at what is happening in uh, the European counterpart, where something similar at this point of time is brewing. The European Union has been coming forth to build this trade uh, ties with India, this trade agreement with India, something similar that's happening with the United Kingdom now. And, and, and things are going to fall in place sooner rather than later. Uh, but any particular reasons that you feel, since you've been in this arena for a long time, and the lack of an agreement and why it has taken us so long? Well, there's probably two or three key reasons. One is I think India from its inception, from its birth um, and, and nationhood um, turned a little bit inward to say, first, we want to build our own domestic economy before we're ready to let the world in. And so it had a more closed approach uh, to global trade. Uh, for, for many, many decades. Um, that started to change when Manmohan Singh was finance minister and you had the first set of big reforms and India started liberalizing and opening up. And it has been a journey since then. Um, but really uh, in the past uh, um, several years and, and really most particularly in the past several months, we've seen a much more ambitious stance from the Modi government towards um, 
opening up trade and towards striking bilateral trade agreements with the United States and with other countries. And I think partly India has come to realize that if it is going to be on the world stage, and if it is going to be competitive with the likes of China, it has got to play not just for its own markets, but for global markets. And you cannot create export-led growth if you do not have trade uh, relationships with major, major partners. So I think that we've seen that journey, but trade is also very hard in democracies. It's hard in the United States, it's hard in India, because trade requires kind of reordering the economy, introducing efficiencies. It will displace some and create hopefully more opportunity than it displaces, but that is a tough political conversation to have. It is one that I think increasingly both governments are recognizing that they have to have, and we're here to help. Okay, uh, then, you know, uh, it's a very dynamic geopolitical scenario post the pandemic that we are witnessing across the globe. There, there seem to be a lot of blocks that are in the, at the time of formation and uh, perhaps not to the liking of the United States or for that matter, you know, when you bring in Russia, then there is a, a sort of contentious ties that are building between United States and China, or for that matter, India and China. And, and, and the world at large has faced with this massive pandemic, this uh, entire chaos that has been created. Uh, how do you then envisage uh, the India-US relationships for global security, which is which is paramount at this time. And how, how is it that more can be done to further strategize it and strengthen it? Uh, and do you think that uh, while India continues to be an ally of the United States and vice versa on various levels, be it strategic, economic, trade, uh, uh, agree, uh, trade, trade ties that we have, but uh, there are agreements and ties and relationships that India continues to harbor with other nations, which United States might not take liking to, uh, how do we ensure that uh, a bonhomie continues to remain between the both, both the nations, especially when it comes to global security, which is a massive concern? Well, first of all, I would say um, that the US and India have been converging our approaches and our aspirations over these past um, two or three decades, uh, certainly two decades, I would say. Um, and that has been evident in the trajectory of the strategic partnership between our two countries under um, former President Bush, you know, under President Obama. Um, um, certainly we continue to see, uh, despite many other challenges, continue to see um, the U.S.-India convergence continue under President Trump and now under President Biden. In fact, Prime Minister Modi, in his first visit to the United States, um, talked about that growing convergence. And in his speech before uh, the joint session of Congress, mm -hmm. uh, talked about overcoming the hesitations of history and, and creating um, that partnership uh, that natural alliance uh, that the U.S. and India have. But both countries also recognize that ours is a unique uh, um, relationship and one that allows for um, accommodation in both directions to different approaches. Mm -hmm. So that when, um, when India has uh, a different relationship that it is trying to um, 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 sustain with other countries in the region. I think you have seen the United States uh, provide a degree of, um, of, of understanding and accommodation. And similarly, I think India has understood that the United States will not always see eye to eye on every matter. But yeah. that's what yeah. partners and allies do, is that you anchor yourself on the main areas of convergence and then you accommodate each other where you might have some slight differences. Okay, fair enough. Uh, another prickly point between the West and the Asian nations, particularly India and the United States, has been about climate change and sustainability. And, and the same was... Uh, amply evident during the COP26 summit that had taken place. Uh, how best do you think can these differences be ironed out? Uh, 
And how can US and India work together to achieve it? Well, look, I think that the major differences are really in kind of a um, um, expectation on differentiated roles and responsibilities based on, you know, uh, um, emission status and, and development status, et cetera, and on financing, climate financing. India has made robust commitments and really ambitious commitments on renewable energy. Um, and India has also understood uh, its own self-interest in creating a um, carbon neutral economy, in bringing in cleaner technology, um, and in safeguarding, you know, its own environment. But India has also, you know, uh, stated that it needs um, it needs the support not only for itself but other developing nations um, of the developed nations to bring in that modern technology and it needs some time. The United States, I think, has understood that. We are, um, however, facing urgency in the climate crisis. And so while there is a great deal of um, understanding of how different countries approach it and what their own um, particulars are, um, exigencies are, there's also this urgency that we cannot um, wait another, you know, um, 20, 30, 40, 50 years to address the crisis, that it really has to be addressed in real time. Mm -hmm. And I think the U.S. and India will actually uh, be very close collaborators in ushering in the new technology and the opportunity that that creates, um, not only for the climate, but also for the economy. So I think that there's going to be actually more um, uh, collaboration than there is conflict on the U.S. and India on climate. Mm. Okay, uh, so you've talked about we've talked about trade, we've talked about uh, climate and sustainability. So I would like to specifically understand from you which are those particular spheres, arenas, sectors that uh, can further join our trade ties, our economic ties between both nations, between the United States and India, and. Uh, also, the fact that has the pandemic ended up becoming a blessing in disguise in view of uh, a number of global supply chains at this point of time in the process of shifting from, from one particular nation uh, that has faced the ire of the entire world uh, to those which are more conducive, which are more friendly, which are more open and democratic in terms of allowing for uh, these uh, plants, factories to set up base. Um, it's a great question, Mega. I would say, you know, look, I don't think under any circumstances we can call um, this pandemic a blessing in 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 the amount of uh, of suffering and and dislocation that it has caused uh, in India, in the United States, and around the world. But what the pandemic has done is underscore um, some of the vulnerabilities in our global supply chain, uh, and it has underscored the importance of of diversifying, um, of de-risking, and also of creating some trusted uh, partnerships that can address uh, critical needs at critical times. Mm -hmm. um, India has been a key anchor for the global response in that India's ability to manufacture at scale uh, needed diagnostics, therapeutics, and of course, vaccines is a key part to how the whole world overcomes the pandemic. And already India has done so much uh, to share its uh, technology and to share its products with the world. The US and India, and frankly, even the Quad um, have understood that uh, that important role that India will play and, and, and is playing and therefore have invested in scaling up India's capacity uh, to produce um, um, these key, key life-saving uh, uh, products, um, um, vaccines and therapeutics, and getting them into uh, the countries that need them. And so I think you're going to see that that trend will continue. Um, and then, you know, even beyond the uh, pharmaceutical space and the medical space, we've seen that um, supply chain bottlenecks 
imposed by lockdowns, by travel restrictions, by uh, shutting down of factories in different places has required us to really rethink uh, our supply chain ecosystem and to not over rely on any one geography. And so companies are increasingly looking to get closer to their markets mm -hmm. rather than in one location. And I think India can stand to benefit from that. Um, but of course, you know, uh, it requires then a very sustained focus on creating that ecosystem. And that's something that we um, are working closely with the government in trying to bring about. Hmm. Okay, uh, I'm going to shift my focus from trade ties between India and United States to how you as an Indian American perceives the United States of America and more importantly, how has how have the Americans perceived Indian Americans in the last decade or so? Has there been a, a, a concrete tilt in the perception of people living in the United States and the rest of the world when it comes to uh, looking at in Indians, uh, the Indian diaspora in, in, in their respective regions? Well, um, Indian Americans in the United States have uh, really um, been woven into every aspect of our society, into the arts, into the culture, into sports, science and technology, uh, politics, and of course, business and, and um, particularly uh, technology. And so you've seen that in the prominence of so many Indian Americans, certainly in the business field with you know, um, great leaders and pioneers like Indra Nooyi, uh, Satya Nadella, you know, um, we, we just um, are, are continuing to see so many others rise up uh, in, um, in, in the business arena, Ajay Banga and, and many others. And of course, they have all um, also been part of the U.S. India Business Council and the journey and the story of U.S. India ties. Mm -hmm. um, and that I think will continue to be the case. Um, but I think what the close ties between our nations reflects is that growing understanding and appreciation of a converging in our cultures, in our, in our um, um, countries that is reflected also in, in, in how um, Indian Americans are also just uh, engaging in all aspects of American society. And increasingly Americans are viewing India because of the lens through which they view it, which is um, um, the colleagues and friends um, that they know in their own communities. Absolutely. Uh, are there still challenges to overcome for the Indian American community? Uh, how was it different back in the Obama administration and the Trump administration and now in the Biden administration? Uh, and, and you would know it so much better than a layman, uh, keeping in mind that you have aggressively, consciously worked in this arena. So I would say the Indian American community um, is emblematic of the larger immigrant community. And that is that um, there are certainly fissures in America and in, in American society, as there are increasingly in um, um, so many parts of the world with um, some trends towards nationalism that can manifest in ways um, that disadvantage immigrant communities. Uh, by and large, America continues to be open, inclusive, um, and supportive. And so the Indian American community has really benefited from that. Um, but it is something that I think we have to uh, continue to advocate for and fight for is to ensure that America continues to be open and inclusive and nurturing of all um, uh, people of all different backgrounds. And then to make sure that, you know, we're supporting those same values around the world. Okay. Uh, are there any changes, alterations, modifications that are required in legislations that are then going to be uh, for the positivity and welfare of the Indian community or, or in, on a larger score, scope, we can say the, the South Asian community. Uh, are there any actions that you are at this point of time uh, as uh, the vice uh, 
uh, senior vice president of the U.S. Uh, State uh, of Commerce are also taking forward proactively? Um, well, certainly we continue to advocate at the chamber for immigration policies that continue to bring um, the nation, the, the world's brightest, most talented uh, people to our shores, you know, through our education system and through employment opportunities. We want to make sure that, you know, the benefits that we have reaped as a nation through the innovation, ingenuity, and hard work of the immigrants who've come to our shores, that we continue to do that. And that is something that the US Chamber has understood. Um, that is something that the business community has championed. And I think we continue to press for immigration reform that allows us to, to be able to attract the best and the brightest um, to come. And, and also, um, to, to bring opportunity for the scores around the world, including refugees um, that, that seek opportunity in our nation. I thank you so much, Nisha, for joining me on this very special broadcast. I congratulate you and wish you all the very best for the first season of uh, US India Business Council. Women Lead uh, will be witness to you uh, interacting with a number of women entrepreneurs, uh, executives, who have uh, accomplished so much in their lives and of course their journeys, their stories and how they in fact uh, are able to influence a larger audience, women uh, and men across the globe and in India. I thank you once again for being with us on NewsX. Thank you so much, Mega, for your partnership and participation in this as well. For more such videos, subscribe to the NewsX YouTube channel, hit the bell icon.